Congratulations, YouTube. You did it. You wore me down and you sucked me back in. I have too many subscribers here just to walk away entirely, especially with no alternative that truly stacks up and so many copycat channels uploading my shows for me anyway. But we can't forget the THC's account here is on thin ice. And so the YouTube version of the show has to be prefaced with this little PSA, only to say that episodes that contain the kinds of themes that have been regularly banned on YouTube will not appear here. And even with that precaution, there's already enough in the archive to get us removed, so remember that the higher side chats could be banned or put in timeout again at any time. And I won't be able to tell you guys about it. So if you feel like it's been too long since you've heard from me here on this digital, dystopian, draconian, data mining monster of a police state seeking platform, your first step should be to check the HigherSideChats.com for the latest shows. Alright? Alright. Enjoy. Brace yourself, because you're about to dive into another free first hour episode of the Higher Side Chats. And we just want to let you know that whether you're looking for a companion through your paranoid insomnia, entertaining yourself through one of life's mundane activities, or trying to ward off the internal screams of all those sad, smothered souls around the office, THC is here. And you should know that every episode of the Higher Side Chats has an entire second hour for Plus members. Sign up at the HigherSideChatsPlus.com and you'll get years of Plus show archives, lifetime forum access, a special invite to Greg Carlwood's monthly joint sessions, MP3s of THC music, bonus episodes, tour videos, and 10% off t-shirts, grinders, and whatever else ends up in the Higher Side store. It's $8 a month that you won't miss, so become a Plus member and treat yourself in these troubled times. Always action-packed and commercial-free, which means you'll unfortunately never hear my voice again. Masters almost surely have a plan There's clearly maybe something there beyond the realm of man Until we've thoroughly tested every last close-chested view Find the more you think you know, the less you really do Where would we be without THC? We know the lying to us just don't know to what degree Where would we be without THC? I said chat show Greg Carwood and Company Drinking a little drink, smoking a little smoke, and dusting off that old opener to kick off a new chapter in the THC journey on the four-year anniversary of my personal chain breaking and yoke offloading. I hope you're all making similar progress. Because the oily appendages of the nefarious few and their slow roll of total control are wasting no time in the constant bombardment on your mind, body, and soul. And their technocratic electrostatic is aimed at making us more erratic, but Dr. Seuss style rhymes aside, I am serious when I say that we sit in a place where the human condition has been fundamentally changed because we spend an increasing number of hours each day merging further with what is actually a highly tuned surveillance and data collection network with a not-so-altruistic goal of ratcheting up everything you don't really want in your life, monitoring your movements under the watchful eye of Google, controlling your brain chemistry and happiness levels with little red notifications, learning to make marketing and advertising more effective than it already is, controlling the information you see and shoehorning you into worldviews that suit the system and pulling us further away from the natural world and the best medicine we have for this encroaching digital death machine. And if that wasn't enough, it's all pulsing radiation into our bodies like a silent jackhammer subtly sending us to our early graves. And in this context, it's no wonder we can't think straight. But put on your mental jock straps, sweatbands, and ankle weights, because we're going to work it all out today with the reigning champion of THC appearances, my friend and yours, the great Gordon Magic Making White, making his most magical ninth appearance on THC. And we're going to try to talk through some frustrations, properly orient ourselves amongst the chaos, profile the important ways the world is changing, and offer up some ways to armor ourselves from the big bombardment. 
Halfway through the first year of cultivating his farm at the edge of the world, one of my favorite esoteric explorers to wash up on our earthly reef, a useful teacher in the era of free-range totalitarianism, the Tasmanian devil himself. Gordon, my good man, welcome back as always. Thank you very much. Happy birthday, Mr. President. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm really glad you could be here, man, because I think this conversation is going to be really refreshing for me. I've gotten a bit exhausted with the world lately. Everything feels quite heavy. I've watched some friends go down some bad roads. I've dealt with some internet creeps and what kind of sort of felt like a coordinated effort to get under my skin. So I've really just bowed out of social media engagement across the board. Maybe I should thank them for that, right? But mainly small things, and you know how they can stack up. And then the news is still nothing but Russiagate for over a year. And with the latest trends in conspiracy, I just feel more unaligned, perhaps, than I usually should. So on multiple levels, I could use a reset, and a show with you does tend to make me feel a bit better. Not that this is a Greg Carlwood therapy session, but I guess I'm here for a new prescription regardless, Doc. Yeah, I definitely resonate with what you're saying there. I mean, there's an element of cooking the frog right now. Yes. And I think a lot of people are, we're not very used to having longer frames of reference. So when you look at what's going on in the world, we have a tendency to think it is new. So it's been a step change that's happened in the last 18 months or whatever. But it's, it's in fact, in particular, when it comes to the US, it's sort of the inevitability of a 40 year neoliberal experiment. And so I resonate with people out there who are like, this is quite toxic. Mm. A lot of stuff doesn't seem all that good. And it's in a weird way looking at how, why this might be a glass half full situation is there is now no other option but to really sit with what it is you're going to do and how it is you're going to think with and be in the world. Because yeah, discourse has been better. Mm -hmm. It has. And you said something in one of your recent podcasts that I liked about how it seemed like we get addicted to the worry, but don't do anything, and then act surprised when the things we've talked about manifest. And that kind of hit me pretty hard. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Maybe it's why I'm having a harder time having fun with a show like this, because it is all getting pretty real. It is. And that's the bit that I'm as surprised as you, particularly when we're talking about a conspiracy audience. As these things in the last couple of years, as there's been a sort of fundamental management change about how the global order is going to work for the next 10 or so years. So a lot of stuff that we've been historically talking about and looking into is sort of appearing from behind the curtain in various different forms, space forces and whatever you want, right? Not only is conspiracy as a discourse not great right now, What's so weird about that is that everything in the world is conspiracy. You'd mentioned the Russiagate stuff, which the media appears to be way more interested in than, and this is a positive, right, than the US public. So the more recent poll that I saw or the more recent survey indicated that less than 1% of the US public considers Russian interference to be the most pressing issue facing the country. But if you look at what's going on on Rachel Maddow's show, for instance, you would think it's the complete opposite. So we're in this world where, and this one is a zero evidence conspiracy, as you're aware, like, but it's the reigning discourse. This should be our time, and it's not. And so it does make you think, what were the psychological benefits? What was the payoff, to use a Dr. Phil, right? What was the payoff for people being involved in parapolitical research and, and, and interest in the kind of topics you cover on this show? And I think there is a difference between what I thought it was. And I was trying to work out how the world works, so it didn't crush me. In many respects, this is legitimate. I think for many people, it's kind of like a Rubik's Cube hobby. Mm. And that's fine, except here we are. There are some fundamental changes going on in the world. And you may want to look at whether you can use that Rubik's Cube for something else. Amen. And I had a similar motivation in mind. Of course, it was, I just want to get out of this shitty job, this job in this false white picket fence dream that was sold to me that isn't going to work out. And I want to get out of it before I get too deep in it. And I'm also interested in all this other stuff. So yeah, it really was. Let's work out how the world works so it doesn't crush us. I think that's a great expression of that motivation. Yeah. Well, I came to it because the world did crush me. 
So I had all this money saved when we first moved to London. And we moved to London two weeks before Lehman Brothers collapsed. So all our money went because I couldn't find jobs for months and months. And I'm watching the news and reading the news. And I'm like, I actually have no idea what they're talking about. And it destroyed the world and took all my money. <laughs> and I like money. So I did not know what a subprime mortgage was. I didn't know how bond markets worked. I didn't know any of this stuff. And that was my bad because maybe if I had known it, I wouldn't have been living on one pound ham sandwiches and <laughs> whatever. And that was my arrival into parapolitical research, which is the world is not as advertised as we all know listening to the show. But also as a result of that, there are risks that you may not see. And I certainly didn't that will sink your ship mm. if you aren't paying attention. So it's just kind of surprising that all of this stuff is happening. And as we mentioned before you hit the record button, people in... So the macro world's talking about Russiagate and the conspiracy world's talking about Flat Earth. <laughs> What's going on, Greg? Right, man. Exactly. That list was Flat Earth. Australia's not real. Nuclear weapons are a hoax. Dinosaurs are a hoax. And Trump is the god emperor reigning in pedophilia networks that have only existed because Hillary Clinton ran the show. Like, it is kind of crazy. And as someone who really wanted to elevate conspiratorial thinking when I started this show, I now feel like all the biggest ideas have gotten away from me. And they are big ideas. I can run my numbers up against the Flat Earth Hour podcast and see that they're doing quite well. And it's just weird to me because I don't understand why when I've kind of worn this badge my whole life, it now doesn't seem to mean what I thought it meant. Well, I understand what you mean. And let's look at what the mostly unfair claims that are commonly leveled at sort of conspiracists. And the main one, let's go back to humbler, nicer times like the 90s, ironically. I don't know. So what tends to be leveled at conspiracists is that you can't handle the complexity of the world. And so you need to invent a story to explain it. Now, I've always found that a bit rich because, in fact, that is what the normies do. Hmm. They can't handle the complexity of the world, so I'll just watch Rachel Maddow. And only in America is geography breaking news where she's pointing out the fact that North Korea has a border with Russia. And you can sit there and go, ah, I know exactly what's going on because this intelligence operative has mentioned that North Korea has a border with Russia. And so it's always been this kind of bizarre hypocrisy to me that people – for me, and probably you, an interest in parapolitics and conspiracy is not just, it doesn't just emerge out of our generalized suspicion of authority, which has been baked into both of us since we were kids. It's also, I'm looking for the complexity and the nuance. I'm not looking for the simplicity. It turns out, if we look at how dire some of the more popular memes in conspiracy are, that there may have, in fact, been something to that accusation, that the world is now too intense and too complex, so let's get the dumbest down version, vision of the world, and hide in it. And the Trump God Emperor one is a very good example. And this sort of feeds into the QAnon thing as well. It's like, okay, I'm just going to reduce the complexity to zero with this invented story and sit there and wait for the world to get better. And I have this unbelievably unnuanced you, and I think that's a psychological reaction, because I think if you step out of it, you realize, well, there is a lot of complexity happening economically, geopolitically, and I am either too scared or too intimidated to put on my big boy trousers and do what I had to do in 2008, which is like, oh, I don't know what's going on, and it's a big deal, so I should probably do that. And I think that's what's happening. I think the fact that there have been that much kind of change has sort of impacted many amygdalas around the world and so you have that fear reaction and an inability to think clearly and that's where we are happy birthday <laughs> <laughs> oh man well it's also like for most of our lifetime if we're in our 30s it wasn't really that hard to see the direction that the globalists were going whether it was left or right bush or clinton or obama like we could see the consistency in that trajectory but there is a difference in trajectory now. You've talked about the big empire pivot. I mean, that does kind of make it a little bit harder to parse out what's going on. And I guess, you know, of course, I want to hear what you think is actually going on. But 
at least I guess to go easy on people, there is a change. Oh, massive change. And worse than that, a lot of sacred cows, a lot of conspiracy sacred cows turned out to not be correct. Like one of the things, I mean, I know you're a crypto nerd and whatever, but there is a (laughs) giant gold bug presence in the conspiracy world. And there's also this very 70s idea that the US needs to protect the petrodollar and that the dollar is about to collapse. Now, the pivot predates Trump. It predates it by a couple of years. You started to see that with the sort of 20% rise in the US dollar beginning about 2014. But also around the world, you had the German chancellor, I'm sure we're not chancellor, the economics minister Schäuble saying the debt growth model is over. The debt growth model is the empire, right? So you actually see the realization that the way that the world has run on this kind of Bretton Woods scheme is no longer, in particular, America's benefit. So we're now pivoting off a way of running the world that has worked for 40 or 50 years and people are, and whatever, you can like gold or all that kind of stuff, but please be aware that a lot of people are emotionally attached to petrodollar analysis, dollar collapse, gold bug, and it's we're in an opposite. The US has been trying to get off the petrodollar (laughs) and gold is irrelevant and the dollar is going to strengthen. The way I saw the world economically work is not what's happening. Ergo, Australia doesn't exist. That's an easier place to live. (laughs) Well, in terms of the US getting off the petrodollar or trying to, what are the indications that that's the case? The petrodollar was a post-war solve that allowed American energy security for growth, but also a kind of long-arm way of managing remnants of imperial colonies in the Middle East. It's a component, in a way, of the Bretton Woods system. So after the war, what happens was America has basically all the money. Europe's in ruins. No one else has anything. America has this enormous economy that they're about to pivot back from being a war machine into a consumer economy. So 70% of world GDP was in the US after the war. And the major problem it was publicly facing was the Soviet Union. So here's the deal. Countries around the world get free access to the American consumer for acquiescing to American geopolitical goals, which is principally the fight against communism. And that was the deal. So everyone got to sell stuff to the American consumer and grow their economies as a result. And They just kind of had to sit on their hands while America's sort of imperial adventurism wrecked half the planet. That model is very expensive and over because one, communism is done. But two, the side effect of this is with the American Navy in particular, but its military essentially funds the security of global trade. So that's what Bretton Woods is. America keeps the world safe and you get to put your stuff on a ship from China or Brazil and take it to the US and sell it to Americans. Hmm. Now, at any other time in history, except it's the British imperial model. So this is how Britain managed to have a laissez-faire global economic growth, but still remain dominant until the end of the empire, was the British Navy. The Royal Navy kept the sea lanes safe. So here's a situation where the Americans, where American taxpayers are paying for a Navy that protects economies that are now competing with and catching up to the US, principally China, of course. And you know, well, and American companies are offshoring their jobs there. And you think this model, this is no longer something that suits America's medium term interests. And so what we have is a pivot around that. But the petrodollar was the kind of way you could run the geopolitics of the world to keep the US dollar dominant off a gold standard in particular. One of the things that we're seeing now as the U.S. is, and certainly by the end of the year, the world's largest energy producer and exporter, so it beats the Saudis, they don't need to force the rest of the world to buy Middle Eastern oil in U.S. dollars because they're selling the energy. So either it's the same cost for them because, you know, you guys are actually making it, or you have to use the dollar because the U.S. is exporting it. So this kind of way of managing Middle Eastern geopolitics as a a petrodollar hasn't really been something that has been useful, especially as it tends to bring the dollar up, hasn't really been useful for a while. So you have all these sacred cows that parapolitically interested folk have relied on for analysis of the world for a very long time that is clearly being rearranged from a monolithic imperial model 
which is again a British imperial model, to some sort of balance of power approach of running the world. So rather than invading it and putting military bases everywhere, which is really expensive and no longer providing the return on investment, given that communism has been defeated, you're now in a situation going, all right, well, we're the biggest economy in the world. I am repricing access to it. And I'm going to kind of use special forces and the rest of it to keep people running countries the way I want them, but we're not going to invade. And in fact, when we have the money and we have the energy and we have the biggest economy, we will tell you where you are in the order of usefulness to America. And that is a much cheaper way of running an empire. And we're kind of moving into that geopolitical direction. You see that with Trump's treatment of NATO. You see that with various well, quite good and believable threats around things like trade wars. In each case, what you're seeing there is a renegotiation of the Bretton Woods arrangement on a country by country basis, because it's over. It's just a cost for America now. And this is why maybe certain elements are rallying around just this roast fest of Trump and the administration, because it's getting more expensive for them. That access is getting more expensive. Yeah. So. Let's say you're a joint chief and your job is actually national security. Now, if you look at where the um, centrist neoliberal imperial project was going to go, including a lead up to a war with the world's only other sort of credible nuclear power as a way of running Eurasia, that's the empire model. Very expensive, makes the fulfillment layer extremely rich. So that sort of Clinton network layer. Which isn't, I'm not being partisan about that. She took money, the, the Clinton Foundation took money from anyone. Yeah. But if you look at what happened, say, after you use Hillary's State Department to install Nazis in Ukraine and Crimea gets siphoned off, but you also get like Biden's kid then running the energy company that's in there. So you have this fulfill. A lot of people got really, really, really rich on this central banking warfare model, is what Catherine Fitz would call it, which is you collapse a country. And you move American companies in that have access to essentially free money from a raising of debt perspective. You collapse a country and you basically harvest it by using money that you create. So a lot of people got rich doing this. And this is a sort of, if you picture a pyramid, like the pyramid, this is what I call the fulfillment layer of empire. So it's that sort of Bilderberg layer of people who do the heavy lifting, and they got very rich doing it. And they probably didn't get the memo from the national security senior management layer, which is this model is making America poorer and less safe. And my job is national security. Mm. So we defeated communism. Like, you have to think about it from that point of view, because I can't see how Trump would have won. I don't think it's Russians. Trump would not have won without military intelligence support. Right. And so that's kind of where you follow the thread along to who is in fact making this decision and why. And from a national security perspective, because I know most of your listeners are American, the thing is that I'm not pro-Trump or any of that stuff in the least, but the thing is they're actually correct. The empire was too expensive. It makes the world less safe. It makes America less safe and it makes America poor. So it needs to shift because you were running on a model that was designed to defeat communism and you ran on it for like 20 years longer than you needed to. So now we're at that shift. And I don't know why um, the urgency was there to get that done in 2016. No idea. Probably has something to do with space, given what subsequently happened, including, and I'll just describe that, two things in particular. It looked like, and we've spoken about this, I think last time when it comes to, to the Stars Academy, it looked like there was the appearance of all that kind of privatized underground base stuff, the electrogravitics and all the toys were going to sort of onboard into the global economy under a presumed Clinton regime where it can come through private means, particularly the likes of Elon Musk and so on. And if you look at what To The Stars Academy's role, I think, was, it was to be air cover and narrative for this onboarding of the really cool stuff that we used to talk about in conspiracy land about, yeah, electrogravitics and directed energy weapons and all that, those things, which still exist even if Australia doesn't. Mm -hmm. But if you look at what subsequently happened, Elon Musk is now, who is going to be one of the principal vectors quite clearly. I mean, he was talking about hyperloops and all that kind of crazy Cold War tech. 
he's gone insane, might be mind control, I don't know, but the point is the mandate of heaven has been pulled from him. And then if you look at those gnomic comments Trump made about Space Force, I would not be surprised if that was in fact describing a force majeure, which is to say, because there's already a lot of stuff up there, most of which are in private hands, as we know, because of the various Freedom of Information Act responses, which allowed for the privatization of things, like everything else that taxpayers pay for, into corporate hands, into military industrial hands, away from FOIA reach. And a force majeure is essentially, because here's the thing, if you are military intelligence, and let's say Raytheon or Intel or whatever has some toys that are in private hands, you can take them, because what are they going to do? Take you to court? They're not supposed to exist. Yes. And I just wonder if when Trump was talking about Space Force, that sounds like military intelligence force majeure to me, which is like, well, in fact, we are asserting military control over stuff that had been privatized and was going to make a fulfillment layer very, very wealthy. That's my guess as to one of the priorities of whoever the people behind putting a game show host in as president. I think he actually believes, and this is just excellent casting, I think he actually genuinely believes the cover story. So I actually think he thinks a trade war is good. And I think they found someone who genuinely believes the cover stories they're going to use to reorganize the economy. And again, that has military intelligence fingers all over it because that's really well chosen. Yeah, useful idiot. Man, that is a great breakdown. And I really have been following these threads in your newsletter, which to me, every time I'm like, oh, okay, there's what I should be looking for because it's really hard to parse out without someone who's digging like, from the alternative perspective like you are, because as we said, most of the conspiracy world is distracted with these almost non-issues when there's a lot of shit going on. And then the mainstream is only concerned with five people, one of them's a porn star, when there's billions of people and a lot of other stuff to look at. So I just think that's a really good breakdown. And the American consumers definitely got to be a bargaining chip. We're well trained. We eat up the marketing. We have more purchasing power than most populations. Yeah, there's value in that <laughs> in us as basically the American empire's product. There is. And if you look at so the trade war, which Trump thinks, and I think he believes this, I think he believes if you correct the trade deficit with China, it is better for the American economy. Now, that's actually not what the tariffs and all the rest of it are for, especially as if you, if you in fact look at the stuff that is coming into the US. I mean, most people think it's, and this is true, like the garbage that you get the little toy in your cereal that says made in China on the bottom of it. And they think China is actually just making actual garbage and tipping it into the US. As a matter of fact, a lot of the stuff that comes back from China is coming back because US companies have outsourced manufacturing steps into China where it's cheaper. So this idea of putting tariffs on U.S. companies trying to bring stuff in, right? That's dumb. But because those tariffs exist, those manufacturing steps will have to onboard. So the other thing, the stuff that comes back from China rather isn't garbage. If you look at the things that the U.S. actually imports, it's miles and miles of giant cement tubing and all the stuff that goes into building infrastructure for energy and the rest of it. So you look at the trade deficit, but you don't actually realize that what's happening is US companies are buying cheap stuff that they need to grow GDP. Now, I think he honestly thinks that the US should be in a trade surplus with China, which is madness. But <laughs> nevertheless, the impact of this is to reorganize and reshape the US economy to essentially be the only game in town. That's the real reason behind tax reform and the next two that are coming, and this is how you'll know it's true, is eventually, probably after the midterms. So next year, the tax reform phase two, I suspect will include dramatic changes to inheritance tax. And the other one you might have seen floating around at the moment, I think I saw it in the intercept, which is Trump's going to give a hundred billion tax break to the very wealthy, which he is. That is the change to capital gains rules on investment in US shares. That sounds boring, but this is kind of why I think people have sort of retreated into flat earth, NASA shill, gold bug stuff, because you actually have to learn what interest and capital gains and so on are to understand what's happening. But at the moment, if you 
if in 1980 you put a hundred thousand dollars into the S and P, and you try to sell it now, you do it in real estate. Hundred in 1980, and you go to sell your house now. You sell it for 550, and you will pay capital gains on it, but you'll only pay capital gains on the bit that is outside of inflation. So you'll pay capital gains on the actual capital gains. Now, if you put the money in shares, one, you'd make more money. It'd be about one, 900 to 1.1 1. 1 if you'd put that 100 grand in the S&P rather than a house in 1980. But let's say it's a million. You pay capital gains on a full 900. So what that does, it's one of those perverse incentives that governments have historically used to get boomers to vote for them, is that they made domestic property extremely appealing and also for internationals like China buying up U.S. inventory as well. So yes, a lot of rich people are about to get a whole lot more money because if they get that change through, you'll have to strip out inflation between 1980 and 2018 and then work out what your actual capital gains are and then only pay the tax on that. But look at what signal that sends to the rest of the money in the world. Inheritance tax, gone, and we will, quote unquote, fairly only tax you on actual capital gains. You should buy U.S. companies. Mm. So you see what he's doing, not what he's doing, but what the plan is, is a complete reorganization of a kind of hypergrowth of an American economy. And that's where the subtext of the various trade wars and smacking Juncker up and down is about. If you're watching this and you think he's a lunatic or an idiot, he may well be. But let me assure you, if you actually look at the money, someone has a plan. Right. Yeah, that's great. I totally agree with the premise that someone has a plan and that this is not... The term coup was used in the beginning, and I don't think coup is accurate because it's just a wiping out of, as you say, the fulfillment layer, but the higher levels of the power pyramid are the ones with the strings, and they're just kind of moving the marionettes in a different direction. It's sort of a coup. Like, you guys have had several, though, if you consider the Bush-Gore election, if you consider the assassination of JFK. Like, you guys are a banana republic when it comes to having coups. So people who say that are kind of a bit correct, hmm. but usually that comes out of the Trump is a god emperor here to save the world, which is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that is not a correct statement. But in a way, it is kind of a coup because it was unexpected from the entire bureaucratic infrastructure of the we might as well call it New World Order, but that kind of Anglo-American technocratic EU management plan, the sort of G7, was not expecting Trump. So it is in that sense a coup, but it's a coup, as you rightly point out, of people at a fulfillment layer. So I just don't think they got the memo because I don't think they would have been happy with the change because they've got very rich with this central banking warfare empire. Right, right. Oh, I just really appreciate that whole outlook. And to kind of zoom out on things a little bit, I wanted to read a quote from your blog that I think fits in well here and also refreshes the memory of our last show. But you say, I just keep coming back to Charles Fort's model of dominance. Under the dominant model, the rules of reality really do change based on what is included and excluded as, quote, real. There's a lot to be said for thinking with that notion when it comes to how you formulate change making in both your own life and the wider world. As in all things, too often generals are fighting the last war, and whatever is going on, whatever has probably always been going on, is spiritual warfare in one sense or another. <laughs> I really like that. So two things there. We talked about the dominant model last time, but maybe you could expand on its usefulness in keeping that model in mind and also of keeping that higher game in mind as opposed to what the generals might be doing. Yeah, so here's the real challenge i think with because like you i'm not pro-trump all the stuff that the anti-trump people say is true he is racist he is sexist he's an awful person he's just awful nevertheless 40 percent of this military intelligence plan is good as far as i can see because it de-risks nuclear war with russia and i mean you guys are majority american so you might be hearing this going well actually it is probably good that the global order is being reorganized as an American, the global order is being reorganized to prioritize America for once because America was essentially harvested to fund the growth of the empire. Mm -hmm. Like all your money left to go and get yield elsewhere. And now that that gain is up, that money's coming back. So some of what's happening is good. Now, a lot of it isn't. 
a lot of it really isn't because we're kind of at that point in the timeline. We're at a fourth turning and there really is a tremendous amount of, you know, toxicity and outright public racism and all this. Like a lot of those concerns are also true. So you look at it and think, generals fighting the last war. Well, what do we do about that? Because this stuff is disgusting. It's going to get worse too. He's going to bring out the racist, sexist dog whistle in the lead up to the midterms. But I don't know if you saw the other week that video of him doing both, being both racist and sexist about Elizabeth Warren and then also talking essentially about how rich he is, which is, you know, get a million dollars if you go and get tested for First Nations heritage. And it's this just magnificently vile combination of racism and sexism and throwing money around. And he's so good at it. <laughs> so this stuff is there in the discourse and it's disgusting. So what do you do about it? And this is the generals fighting the last war thing. You look at it and go, there is activating. So being an activist used to be marching and whatever. And arguably that had some effect during something like Vietnam or Korea. But it doesn't now. No. Like it doesn't work. It actually makes everything worse. So here's the strategy of it. Like you can be so angry about this and go, oh, I need to get on the march. The march just further reinforces the people that respond to the dog whistle that they're correct. And as a result, it further reinforces the people who might think they're left, but they're actually neoliberal apologists for empire. Hmm. They think, oh, well, this is getting worse. And it is getting worse. So this entire strategy needs to be reconsidered. This is the generals fighting the last war. You think, well, I'm not happy, and rightly so, about the state of discourse in the world, but in particular the U.S., where there really is a lot of gross, racist, and whatever stuff happening. The marches used to work, now they don't. So what do we do? If they make them worse, we need another strategy. And that's kind of where the dominant of wider inclusions comes in, which is, well, we're in this new world. We're in a fourth turning. And there are things we actually know. There are things we know from 140 years of psi research. There are things people who have taken their spiritual journey seriously know, which is the spiritual is real. And so as a result, these, these wars are always cosmic, but they are differently cosmic when we know that your intentions can fundamentally alter reality. And I don't just mean magic. I just mean general intentionality, although obviously I mean magic. <laughs> and so you think, well, then, how does this work if the collectivist, let's get a big enough group of people and march on Washington strategy will fail, but a decentralized, well, let's all become little Rivendells. So let's see, how can I make my sphere of influence better? How can I make it less toxic? The things that I can do, how can I elevate them? And then you have this kind of mycelial connection of a decentralized people trying to change the world of millions of little Rivendells because the decentralized model is much more that wider inclusion. It's not the sort of pre-internet solve of we just need to get a lot of people together and all in the one space and then someone somewhere will listen and things will change. Like The management of the world is not responsive at all to what it is you think should happen. Not at all. You could get all of California to march on Washington and nothing would change. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. What is surprising to me is that arguably, except for maybe Vietnam, it's never worked. We're trying to do more of something that not only has probably never worked, just looking at the kind of data of how history unfolds, and also is definitely not going to work, but we do have the data that shows that there is, in fact, something that does. <laughs> and so that's been a real challenge in navigating, because if you approach that from a materialist perspective, particularly if you are a centrist materialist, it sounds like inaction. And I have to be careful with these words because it's actually the opposite. I see people putting their pussy hats on and going for a walk. And I go, that's inaction to me because that won't do anything. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I get the hater aid because they see what I'm doing is inaction. But I'm like, I think it's actually the only thing that will work. Yes. Like, I honestly think it's the only thing that will work. So Who's the inactive one here? <laughs> and what a great tee up for the Bilbo stuff, you know, right at the right time. Look at you, seasoned pro. But <laughs> let's get into some of that stuff, you know. We talked about the archetype of Jack Sparrow as a model for living in a chaotic world once upon a time. And I think movie characters are great templates for people because we're all pretty familiar with them. 
you did a recent solo show that really dug into Bilbo Baggins. And just like Jack Sparrow, probably not a place where a lot of people would expect to find any sort of model. But I think you do make some good points. What can we learn about the way to approach the world and maybe restore some hope through looking at Mr. B? Yeah, I still have my 90s chaos magic DNA, which is that sort of interest in pop culture that tends to annoy the more serious, magically inclined people. (laughs) That's my favorite part. Same. (laughs) I kind of delight in doing that. The Jack Sparrow stuff still holds from a economic advantage perspective, and for at least half the morality, maybe even more. What Bilbo has to offer, and this is, and by Bilbo, we're obviously talking about Tolkien in general and his conception of Middle Earth. And what's important about that is that he did go to war and we have, well, the premium members and I definitely have a very Jungian understanding of what Middle Earth is and what Bilbo represents. And whilst Tolkien himself may not have articulated in those terms, he asserted there was a certain kind of reality to this stuff. So let's just say Bilbo was a certain archetype, but there is a tremendous wisdom in looking at his journey versus what you might get in a more recent, I don't even want to say action film, I don't even know if that's a term anymore, but a more recent film that's like an adventure where you have a hero and what generally happens is, I use Star Wars as an example, so you pluck this little farm boy off his farm and by the end of the trilogy, he fights and defeats the big bad guy. So either Darth Vader or the Emperor, whatever you want. And that is the hero's journey. So that is a sort of encapsulation of an individual process. It doesn't describe reality very well. So it's useful to kind of think with the idea, and whoever you are, you are that hero in your life. But if you look at how you want to be in the world and what it is we can actually do, what Tolkien managed to describe, and whether this was intentional and based on the fact that he went to war and others didn't and he lost some friends and and what it was people were fighting for and so on, As you look at Bilbo, and Bilbo is the main character of The Hobbit. He is The Hobbit of The Hobbit, obviously. And he gets swept up by the forces of history. So stuff is going on in the world. I noticed it more because I hadn't, after I finished the Q2 course with premium members, I gave myself a few days to decompress. And I watched, I think for the first time ever, the extended Hobbit trilogy all through in a couple of days. Like I'd seen them all before, but I hadn't done it as a single session situation. Wow. I don't recommend it if you're busy, but I otherwise do recommend it. (laughs) And there's some pieces that Peter Jackson has gotten right that Tolkien, or done better than Tolkien. Not many, but there are a few. And one of them, I think, in The Hobbit is to kind of build a bit more tension and importance to the story. Because one of the criticisms that was leveled at Tolkien after he wrote Lord of the Rings was, well, you've turned Gandalf into this amazing character and there's this huge cosmic battle going on for middle earth so why in the hell was gandalf going on effectively a treasure hunt or i've heard once described as an eating tour of middle earth in the hobbit and why did he not recognize the ring so it's because the first book is for kids and the follow-up book was once tolkien had more deeply engaged with that imaginal realm the whole thing comes roaring through but bilbo is not a luke skywalker hero he's swept up By the forces of history, and moment by moment, wherever he is, he basically does the best he can in that small way of hobbits. He does the best he can, and he doesn't even end up fighting the main bad guy. He doesn't kill the dragon, and he doesn't kill Azok or whatever the big um, orc guy that effectively Peter invented. So he's just sort of there. But, and this is the wisdom that you get from Bilbo and Middle Earth, and it's articulated in a strange way by Galadriel in Fellowship of the Ring. Even the smallest of us can change the course of history because the events would not have unfolded if Bilbo hadn't effectively tried to do his best at every moment, winning or not. And he's not the hero. He's not the guys that kill the dragons and, and you know fight Sauron and all that kind of stuff. And that seem to me a really good model of or a potential source of inspiration for how it is how you decide to do what you can do in the world because you don't get to fight Sauron. So you don't single handedly defeat Trump or whatever it is you consider to be Sauron. Like that is not for you. That's not your fate. But nevertheless, there is stuff you can do and it appears that history works like this. It's not just Middle Earth. 
history works in this non-linear, unpredictable way. Little moments of it. There's actually macro sweeps on a cycle basis, but not being rude to that waitress because you had a bad day. You don't actually know if that isn't the thing that changes the whole world. And that's the kind of Bilbo lesson. Like You do your best in these situations and generally try not to be a dick. In that asserting sovereignty is a bit too strong a word. In trying to make your sphere of influence better, you don't know if you're Bilbo. You don't know if you were the thing that rules the fate of many, which was the kind of really delightful twist in all the books, which is he decides not to kill Gollum in The Hobbit, in the book as well as the movie, after he's got the ring and he's air invisible and he can kill Gollum, but doesn't. And it's the pity that stays Bilbo's hand is the line. And because of that, so Bilbo's pity ruled the fate of many because obviously you jump all the way to Return of the King and Gollum needs to be alive for the ring to be destroyed. And that's that kind of weird spiritual wisdom that you find in Tolkien that I think suggests... I think suggests a more effective way of, I guess, being an activist. If we know that the collective approach doesn't work, you don't know if whatever it is you're doing in your sphere is going to be the thing that ends up destroying the ring. And that's really encouraging. That's actually glass half full. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to get across to people is, this isn't settling and this isn't inaction. It's the opposite. And it's, I hope, because it has for me, I hope it provides a framework for people's really understandable sense of like, I need to do something because the world should be better. Yes. And if you have the options of protesting or going, you know what, I, I'm actually just going to try and be that little Rivendell. See how far I can Rivendell my life. And that's why I think Bilbo is the hero for our times. <laughs> I love it. I think it's a great response to the general doom and gloom. And I do think you're right as well. I've always kind of thought, no matter how the conversations were going on the show about how bad things are, that trends, yeah, you can pick out the trend and it might be a decades long trend, but trends have counter reactions when they reach a certain point usually. And here we are talking about this giant pivot and all this kind of shit. But uh, on an individual level, man, I mean, what kind of Bilbo-esque butterfly effect, as you put it, small things with outsized fate impacts can people do in our world? I know we can be nice to the waitress, sure, but anything more activisty? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you are, and I get it, your political leverage decreases every step you go up to the point where i mean even at a state level it's zero but like let's just say you get up to the president and it's zero or negative but if you are interested in like saying actually i I need something meatier my goodness if you don't know your sheriff's name and your mayor's name and the rest of it that's where you start you actually start at a local level and this is that thing Catherine says this as well like a mighty army arises when you do that because think of the distribution of people listening to this show you must have Maybe one in every county in the U.S. is not that many counties. So there's a leverage opportunity there of being active at a lower level. So it's not just trying to be Jesus in your day-to-day life and just being nice to people. You actually can get involved, but the trouble is, because of how dominant this macro narrative that you cannot impact is, people think that that's the battle and that's what they need to do, but you have never been able to influence a president or a monarch or something. You've never been able to. (laughs) And you just think, can you imagine, like, what if you die tomorrow? Can you imagine being at the gates of, you know, St. Peter's gates and he's going, so what did you do? How did you try to save the world? I'm like, well, I yelled at the president on Twitter and I was just generally unbelievably toxic to people around me because I was so angry. And you think, do you try and explain your steps to St. Peter and see if you're heading in the right direction. So there's the local activism. and there is also, broadly speaking, spiritual warfare. There's also the fact that you can use prayer and intention to make the world better. You can also use your economic clout, an individual economic clout, to buy with integrity. Now, that's very often a marketing scam, particularly if you're shopping in supermarkets and so on. But it need not be. You just need to kind of set yourself up a policy of going, I'm going to spend the most amount possible, the closest distance possible to my house, 
and extend out from there on everything. So if you can find, and obviously the people you deal with have to have integrity and so on, but there are a bunch of ways that you can start greening the desert by getting involved politically, by engaging in spiritual warfare in the correct way, which is essentially trying to make things better around you and praying for sort of macro stuff, so not being toxic, but going for increased peace or increased tolerance or, or so on. These things have been proven to work. There are decades of research behind this kind of stuff, so it's not inaction, it's the opposite. And then there's the economic lab. The thing is, it depends on your context. So you can really only say macro things because I don't know what your particular Bilbo experience would be. In the show you mentioned, I also kind of say, like, that actually scales up. So we were talking about the Joint Chiefs earlier. Like, if you have a very senior job at the Pentagon and you are responsible for things like drone striking your many weddings and, and all the rest of it, in a funny way, that's still a Bilbo experience because you have to rely on your personal experience of the immediate surrounds, which is your workplace, and you have to be conscious of the thoughts and that you're bringing to it and consider the morality of either doing this or not doing it, even though you were told to and so on. So there's kind of the Bilbo experience of changing the stuff you can around you, in fact, scales up. So it's almost like the individual thing works at every scale. So again, where you are in your context will determine what it is you can actually do. And there is some good stuff as well. And this is a sense of sort of waiting for, there is some good stuff in the collective action. One of them, I think, you guys have way too many federal agencies, right? Mm -hmm. Way too many. Way too many people with guns that can take you from your houses and either deport you or whatever it is. There's buildup of them. So you look at what the centrist Democrats have decided to be a wedge issue. And this is the bit where you kind of have to say this bit and say it's not a pro-Trump statement. Because you've got to look at the glass half full, which is the whole ICE deportation thing, which is vile. It is looking like, I don't care which federal agency you start with. If ICE ends up getting abolished, great. Now move on to ATF or DEA or any of these other like dozen things that does the same stuff for you, <laughs> which is tyranny, <laughs> essentially. Right. They're trying to use it as a wedge issue. And this is the bit that sounds pro-Trump, it isn't. It's like a wedge issue for a U.S. policy that long predates the current administration. So that's the bit where you've got to be careful and seize the opportunity because you don't want to fall into the bait of being like abolish ICE, but this is just a continuation of policy. That's getting caught in the partisan weeds. Watch that stuff and go, there might in fact be an opportunity to start unpicking various federal agencies. And if it starts with ICE, great. So that's the sort of weirder, higher mind thinking that allows you to combine local political action with, you might be in a swing state that you might have someone who's promising some action that you agree with when it comes to ICE in particular. Vote for them. Cross the aisle if you think this is, we're in that stage of being that kind of strategic. And there's, there's so much stuff we could do. I know it's really bad out there. And I know you just kind of have to take a few deep breaths realize that maybe you need to re-educate or reorganize your thoughts about how the world is being managed and just there's so much humans can't die i've had this conversation as well you actually can't be killed by what's going on even if you are physically murdered you're not dead the thing that you really are can't be destroyed so there's so much power and people don't realize they're playing reality in god mode because you are god mm. So it's an attitudinal adjustment that allows you to live your best Bilbo life, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well said. And you know I like a good video game reference. <laughs> and, uh, something else from that episode that I really liked was the picture you painted of a future that I've never really heard described anywhere else. Because like you said on the last show, you expect anti-gravitic crafts and those sort of quarantine deep state toys to start getting rolled out possibly in the next two years, which seems incredibly soon given how political timelines work. But we also need to get back to living amongst natural systems. So talk to us about this hobbit hole flying saucer vision of the future, because I thought it was quite creative. No, right, right, right. If you look at how the kind of stuff that's in the proverbial underground bases probably works in a way that is the propulsion system 
by definition, and I think Dr. Laviolette is probably the closest in terms of it being electrogravitic, it's almost a development on Tesla in the sense that you're dealing with using counter rotation to create like a local gravity effect so that you have that quote unquote free energy. I think that's probably what it is. I think that's probably the best description is a more accurate way of saying it because inevitably he's going to be wrong because he doesn't build these things, right? Now, the implication of that as opposed to how we use hydrocarbons in a combustion engine to propel things around in gravity is a quote-unquote flying saucer is essentially natural because it harmonizes with how the universe works or else it wouldn't. Now, you can kind of make the case that hydrocarbons do because you are sort of releasing their stored energy in a series of small explosions that will then drive pistons that will then move your car around. And, you know, fine. But that's not actually what I mean. I mean, the fact that these things can work continuously and at high speeds in space sort of puts it in a different category, and in this free energy category. Now, you mentioned the farm at the beginning of the episode. At the beginning of the year, I moved on to a small farm in southern Tasmania. There's a very green permaculture designer. The intention over the next few years is to fully permacult this place and have the house optimized from that kind of perspective. And one of the things that you will find in the permaculture designer's manual in a way, but also in more recently Retro Suburbia by David Holmgren, excellent book, is this idea of a cool cupboard. Now, a cool cupboard is pretty much just what it sounds. It's a fridge replacement. So it's a larder that you have in your house. And how it works is that you dig a trench a meter deep, about 15 to 20 meters long, and you put a pipe in it, and it obviously sticks up so it gets air in in the middle of your yard or so on. But this is the equivalent of a flying saucer because people in permaculture will describe that as a low-energy solution. But it's free energy because it is how you are harmonizing with how the universe actually runs. So the air comes from outside through the pipe where it's deep enough and long enough that obviously the stored heat gets stripped out so that by the time it sticks up through your floor and into your cool cupboard or fridge replacement, the air is cool. And the thing is, refrigerators haven't actually improved, even though they can now text you and say, pick up milk or order it from Amazon and all this other ridiculous monitoring stuff that you don't need in your life. The actual science behind why we refrigerate food hasn't changed that much and is, if anything, gotten worse as our food supply chains have lengthened. So if you talk to, say, I did a documentary on Falun Gong or Falun Dafa a long time ago. So you have Chinese mystics and Chinese energy workers who will tell you that for some reason the chi in Western stomachs is really cold and slow. And then they worked out, oh, you guys eat refrigerated food. This is not how it's supposed to work. But mm. Most of the stuff that we keep refrigerated doesn't need to be as cold as it is. So cheese is a very good example. Like It needs to breathe and whatever. And you just put the kind of stuff that doesn't need to be refrigerated towards the bottom of the cool cupboard and you stack it up towards things that need less of it. Again, at the top, you would have leafy greens and things that you're going to eat recently. So this, this flying saucer cool cupboard combination is how, it's again, one of those utopian things. How can you live in a way that, the natural functioning of the universe helps you grow or improves your life rather than makes it worse. And there's just this amazing opportunity to start thinking, this is, I think this is the point of utopias, rather than to have them fulfilled, which never works. It's to kind of dangle at the edge of our perception, that star to follow, and to always be hopeful and to have it improve. So for me, there's a lot of things you can actually do just by changing your perception about the kind of cosmos you actually live in, that invites, again, more optimism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just think that is a great kind of utopian vision for the future because it hasn't really been put on the big screen, you know, as much sci-fi, dystopian, utopian, future-driven stuff we've been given. I've never really seen a kind of back-to-nature paradigm with a flying saucer parked in the driveway in a little hobbit hut. I think it's very cool. Yeah. The closest you'll get is Ursula Le Guin, some of her work. Hmm. But yes, my perfect vision for the future, so my utopia, I think it would look like a perfected Polynesian society. So we're multiplanetary and you have local governments organized by bioregion and it's all river catchment because if you did it this way, you would, that's your soul for pollution around the world, literally. The same thing once we're on Mars. And so there's this kind of combination of high technology, 
us moving between multiple planets and within those planets we're actually harmonizing with the local biosphere and having that kind of local economy and food production systems that improve the soil and the planet rather than make them worse and the thing is as far as i can tell we do have flying sources we do have permaculture whatever it's not going to happen, but my utopia could happen. <laughs> yeah, well, that's kind of a thread that I've explored on the show that kind of surprised me that I didn't know I would love so much. And I know there's much more to explore, but those kind of alternative scientists who looked for things more in tune with nature, like a Victor Schrauberger, Wilhelm Reich, you know, Tesla, I guess. I've done shows that get into Native American abundance engineering because we think they just lived like uh, play it as it lies, but that isn't the case. They actually did things to engineer the abundance. And that's like such a paradigm change. And so incorporating all that kind of stuff with high technology, deep state toys. I mean, that is pretty much my utopia too. It seems so fun. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a pretty heavy thing to end on, but I gotta, I gotta ask you because I think you have an insight into conspiracy, magic, and psychology, which are all involved here. But lately, I have seen more than one person I know go through a classic, too deep down the rabbit hole, psychological break, hospitalization in one case. And it weighs really heavy on me as a conspiracy peddler. <laughs> but it also seems to be an archetype of philosophers who think too hard and go over the edge. Classic the number 23 kind of stuff. And it happens with conspiratorial thinkers and magic practitioners. And we can use medical terms like bipolar or schizophrenic, but being someone who has what I think is a more accurate model for things like the mind and consciousness and where ideas even come from and how spirits can interact with us sometimes without us knowing, what do you think is happening to a person who goes through that process and maybe never comes back the same because I'm really not satisfied with just the clinical psychology explanation. Yeah, well, that's understandable because it's based on a faulty science of mind, which is quite materialist. So I want to be clear that having just said that, even though the classifications are arbitrary for people out there, mental illness is a real thing, etc. <laughs> this isn't a Tom Cruise statement. So there is psychotic breaks, and that's what I'm going to talk about now in a way which is fundamentally different to something like bipolar disorder and what have you. Thoughts are real, Greg. That's kind of what you're intimating. Like, they're real. They have some kind of reality. Mm -hmm. If you haven't improved, which is, the materialist one is 100% wrong. So any step up, idealism, whatever you want, next step up from that, you're in a better situation. The implications of a even 99% wrong science of mind is that thoughts have some reality. They're not just in your head. They extend beyond it. Thoughts may have people rather than people have thoughts, which is a very Jungian idea. So they're real, which means some of them are dangerous. And I don't mean dangerous like you should avoid them, but they can fascinate you onto the rocks in the same way a mermaid can. And as a result, if you're getting too involved in anything, and it doesn't even need to be conspiracy, guess what? Forest time for you. <laughs> meditation time for you. All of these things. Because, yeah. You use some really good examples there of just various geniuses and musical prodigies and all that kind of stuff, other than just magicians. Whatever the, however you want to call it, the imaginal or the mindscape or what have you, has a reality. And very often, if you don't know that going in, you are in a situation of increased risk of hitting those rocks. So yeah, and it is a case of, especially if you're under situations of anxiety and so on at the same time like if you want to think these thoughts if you actually want to follow and want is maybe the wrong word this almost comes back to the kind of telos of conspiracy in the first place if you feel you should follow these very bad people whatever they happen to be from a kind of managing the world perspective down that route if you want to know what it is they're doing and how they're thinking that's some really dark places that you go. Mm -hmm. And if you do that in a case of in anxiety and, and obsession and so on, then, yeah, you, you put yourself at risk. And if people listening to this are in that situation, honestly, the Headspace app is genuinely, even the free version, will sort you out as long as you do it. <laughs> it's great. It is great. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's kind of what's going on. I think there's a sort of macro understanding of 
there is a failure to appreciate the dangerousness of thoughts because they are real. And that's a kind of societal failure, right? Because we don't think they are. We say it's just in your head or it's just a dream. And so we, we don't bring the right wariness to going down those dark roads that maybe we should. Mm -hmm. And also because we don't think they're real, we don't think, okay, well, I need to, I need to step back from this, get some forest bathing on, look at the sun, not like in a Trump eclipse way, but like up in the morning. <laughs> uh, I need to kind of get back to the analog and the authentic if I'm going to do this again. Cause it is like that. You know this. I mean, this is your job as well. Like it can get intense. Mm -hmm. It can get really intense. You go, do you know what I need to do? Not any more of this research for a bit. <laughs> Cheers to that. And dude, great answer. Always great talking to you. Good medicine all around, Doc. Your podcasts have been super great lately. You have two new courses since we last talked, one on the role of saints in the European magical tradition and another on the Greek magical papyri. These are the things that any THC fan should consider. It's weird, but it's also high level and very educational. RuneSoup.com is the portal. Is there anything else to tell the people about your ongoing projects or impressive workload? No, I mean, it's all there. It's all there at RuneSoup. You can find the books if you're interested and the membership if you are as well. This quarter's course is on magical geography and spirits of place. And, and funnily enough, there'll be some forest bathing data in it. So if you guys are kind of looking for a, an updated way of thinking with your local environment from a physical and spiritual perspective, that may be your jam as well. And maybe I should have mentioned that. There you go. Q3 uh, course. <laughs> nice. Well, again... Always much appreciated. I know you're a lot busier than you once were. Coming back here for a ninth time probably isn't the first thing you want to do in the morning, but I appreciate it all, man. I hope the people do too. Best of luck on the farm and take care. I wouldn't be anywhere else, Greg. So thank you very much. And happy birthday again. Bam, people. Gordon White, number nine. Look at that. <laughs> I feel a bit better and thoroughly refreshed. I hope it was clear why we sectioned a big part of this talk around the state of conspiracy culture. Because we both enjoy it, and we both appreciate it. I think it generally offers a more accurate worldview than the bulk of the adopted perspectives out there. But I also think it has gotten a little off track from things that are useful. And that's understandable because so many things have changed. So people are kind of erratic and trying to latch on to some new idea. And I mentioned my list of things that are hot topics that I don't find very useful. Flat Earth, QAnon, Dinosaur Hoax, Australia Isn't Real, these sorts of things. And on one hand, who cares about definitions and labels for a show like this? But on the other hand, if these are the biggest themes today in conspiracy culture by the numbers, then I sort of have to wonder why, after many years, I'm so out of alignment with these themes. I think some of them might have a little merit, but most of them are silly, and they don't do anything to help us progress. It's like we're in the midst of this battle, but acting like the disinterested kid on the soccer field kicking around dirt and yelling, hey, do you guys know these white lines are made out of chalk? When we should really be focused on our opponents barreling downfield towards us. And it also really gets under my skin when the advocates of these positions just dismiss any naysayer as, oh, well, they're just not woke or they're just not open to this. No, I'm open to it. I just don't know that a lot of these things matter that much. And I know we've covered a lot of these things, and I'm sure they will come up again. It's not like these are banned topics. But of what real value are they? And where on the totem pole of ideas should they really be placed? I would say they're a little too high right now. And I said when I started this show that I wanted to elevate conspiracy culture, and that's true. I try to get real career professionals to talk about something like MK Ultra, as opposed to some neckbeard in the basement. Because if these things are true, as we think they are, we don't need to shy away from details and facts. Let's get in there. And when I started this show, there were fewer options. I didn't think that we needed the overly Christian lens of Coast to Coast or the screaming, pulsating, vein-in-the-neck aggression of Alex Jones. I don't find either of those things useful. They are things at the time when those were the only options that were things I'd have to overlook to focus on the meat, which was always 
So how can I get around this rigged system? How can I really understand what's going on? And I still agree that it's good to hold everything up to the light and ask the unbiased question, is this true or was I sold a lie here? But I'm finding a lot more people solely focused on that process and just throwing everything at it and seeing what sticks or seeing what generates the most attention. And I think a lot of these things might be distractions from reality rather than tools for constructing a more useful map when we navigate it. And I just love the two-pronged approach of what's wrong with conspiracy and what's the real deal with this administration's agenda. Gordon's take on the imperial pivot offers a lot of clarity, I would say. Clearly, something has changed, but maybe it's not the god emperor rounding up deep state pedophile networks. So his breakdown from the economic alterations to the possible rollout of the big toys all kind of makes sense to me. And then we throw Bilbo in because it's fun and there's also something in there to consider as a hopeful template. So all three aspects I find really fitting right now and very appropriate for a THC anniversary. It got me thinking about these concepts all week, and I think creating the world we want locally is a lot more on the table than we realize. The tools of networking and influencing those around us seem sort of base level and boring, but it's how the elite make the change they want. How about you try it around the neighborhood? Another point about the slow drip of disclosure, there was a story going around on big websites that got sent to me a couple dozen times about the pyramids being used for energy generation. Something we've heard before, but this was coming out in a mainstream rollout kind of way, almost as if to say, oh, we just figured out the pyramids, so now we can incorporate what we know into the changes in how we produce your energy, you know? Because they got to frame all this as new discoveries, so I thought that was pretty interesting. And in terms of our little recalibration of conspiracy, Chris Knowles must also be thinking about this stuff lately because on the day we recorded this show, he released a blog post at the Secret Sun titled The X-Files Exit and the Death of Conspiracy Culture, Part 1. And it's about a lot more than just what we talked about today, but clearly he's seen conspiracy culture going off the rails too. And how convenient for the Empire, right? It's almost as if they want us looking into certain rabbit holes and not others. Maybe it's just growing pains. I like to think that the internet, you know, still fairly new, and people's ability to do all these further out questionings is just a form of exercising that new ability. And it's all going to snap back to the important stuff eventually. But I think we all appreciate the shows that are personally useful, and today we return to that in a big way. Use your inner Jack Sparrow for those smooth, fluid movements towards your goals on a chaotic and choppy conspiracy. And then how do we move towards fixing the world when we don't really get to fight Sauron? The Bilbo model. And if you only heard the first hour, I think there is a lot of useful advice to save your life in the second, well worth $8, because we told you how to avoid cancer at no additional cost. (laughs) But really, the topics included retro suburban solutions, how to influence your neighbors and jailbreak your neighborhood into moving towards Gordon's utopia, pivoting towards the analog by using the digital, eating your enemy, tricks for introducing yourself as a professional fringe peddler, forest bathing, sun gazing, and other beautiful things. So sign up for the Higher Side Chats Plus if you haven't already. You've come this far. And big thanks for all the Plus members being cool and patient and supportive during the price change. I know I've talked to a lot of you individually. We had a couple small hiccups, but I'd say it was a B-plus transition. And now we're on the other side of it, and it's all good. As for the first edition of the joint sessions, I'm still working out exactly which program to use. I'm thinking Zoom, but I also have to figure out exactly how to structure it. I'm not used to doing video, but I think that's what the people want. And the more I think about it, the more I think what we also want is for the open lines to be available to everyone, not just Plus members. But then we just archive the sessions for on-demand viewing for the Plus members. Because I don't want to have to cut off a caller or roll my eyes at something knowing that every caller is a paying customer. I'd be forced to be on my best behavior. I think we would do better 
and have more fun if we let in the crazies. <laughs> and all that's going to happen soon. I'll probably have a date and time announcement in the next show. I'm thinking sometime between the 20th and the 30th. But as for today, that pretty much does it. I was also thinking about the power of manifestation and ideas and the imagination realm. And of course, it's Gordon's utopian vision that we talked about today. And I think the visual is quite potent. And we just broadcasted it to a lot of people. Now, tens of thousands of people also have that vision. And if ideas we hold in our head can manifest and are actually real, then let's water that little motherfucker and see if we can't get it to sprout somewhere in the world. And then we can nurture it and model it out. And maybe I'm just on a good high and inscrutably optimistic. But if you can't think of anything to meditate on, meditate on that. And I'll see you next time. Your move, Jack Sparrows, Bilbo Bagginses, and fellow carriers of the conspiratorial torch. Your fucking move. Happy holidays and Merry Christmas. We're going to talk about angels and miracles with Rosemary for a few hours tonight. Coast to yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't Day the after the Christmas. All the angels in the heart. What Genesis did right. It's getting old. It isn't pleasing. I turn the station. I am done. Maybe it's not my dear apartment. Maybe I should shut my mouth But Mr. Jones is quite the harlot With all the ads he's reading now Working with my team, we set out to find the best for you But the it's fine Now that I have THC I'm feeling more at home than I ever had before Info wars are just drowning slowly Coast to coast isn't going nowhere All these shows are just drowning slowly I'm sure you must Feel kind of dirty after each commercial spot. Tuning in at certain hours on demand is what I want. THC. It's the show that I adore. Now I'm feeling more. At home than I ever had before.